Thessalonians chapter 4. <laughs> Brethren, we pray and beseech you in the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so also you would walk, that you may abound the more. For you know what precepts I have given to you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles that know not God, and that no man, and that no man overreacheth nor deceive his brother in business, because the Lord is the avenger of all these things, as we have told you before, and have testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto sanctification in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the Gospel, okay, then go to St. Matthew chapter 17. At that time Amen. Jesus took Peter and James and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his garments became white as snow. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elias talking with him. And Peter answering said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And as he was yet speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and lo, a voice out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And the disciples, hearing, fell upon their face, and were very much afraid. And Jesus came and touched them, and said to them, Arise, and fear not. And they lifted up their eyes, saw no one but Jesus alone, only Jesus. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Amen. If you have considerations on this, the second Sunday of Lent, there's now, a, of course, a great crisis going on in our church and our world. And we are seeing signs that we are getting closer and closer to the full outblowing, our full uh, uh, explosion of the crisis in the church and the chastisement that's supposed to come upon us. We're already in it right now. But just a couple of weeks ago, the bishops of Ukraine, not some of the bishops in the Ukraine, asked Pope Francis to consecrate Russia to the Magna Heart of Mary. And of course, he did not respond. And it brings to, to uh, and then we see the war going on in Ukraine, and difficulties in our world, and we hear the, the words of the prophet, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 24, where he talked about the end of times, and also in the Old Testament, and the prophecies of the last several hundred years. There will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be persecutions. There will be uh, earthquakes in many places, and there will be great tribulation. And this will be a beginning, a sign of the beginning of the troubles, the troubles that are about to come. Now, these are not yet the troubles of the actual time of the Antichrist, which shall come later after the victory of Our Lady, but we see very much that we're in the time of troubles right now, and it's very easy to, to uh, see that we're close to the victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that trouble is on the horizon, and trouble is with us right now. And what is the spirit of the church during this battlefield, during this time? And what is it that we are supposed to do in this period, of, in this time of crises? One thing we note is that there has always been difficulties in the church. There have always been evil men. There have always been crises. There have always been difficulties. And this must be the way in this life, because we have to prove ourselves the followers of Christ. And what is it that we're obliged to do? When we look at the history of the human race, we see that God created man political. He created him social. He created him male and female. And then they had children. And when he created man, the first thing he said about him after he created him was, it is not good for man to be alone. So there's something in the nature of man that it is not good for us to be alone. Angels, of course, are a part of society. They're a part of the universe. But angels cannot increase and multiply. Angels cannot develop and build. Angels don't build churches. 
Angels don't have children. Angels don't make converts. Angels don't build. Angels are only messengers. The word angel means messenger. They carry messages from heaven to earth. It is not in the nature of angels to build. 6,000 years ago, when Lucifer fell, one third of the angels went into hell, and not one angel joined them in hell after that. The kingdom remained exactly the same size. In the kingdom of heaven, two thirds of the angels followed St. Michael and went to heaven, and not one of those angels fell. And not one angel from hell called the devil ever left hell to go to heaven. There was no increase or decrease of the angelic kingdom of heaven since the first day of the creation of the world. No increase or decrease to the demonic kingdom of Lucifer in hell. And the angels are just as perfect today after 6,000 years as they were back then. Gabriel did not become better when he came down to earth. And neither did Raphael become better when he came down to earth. They simply fulfilled their duty before God. And Michael, who did his great day of, of, of battle and combat 6,000 years ago when the world was created, he has not increased. He has not gotten holier. He has got, not gotten more powerful. He still is as powerful as he was then and as holy as he was then. But when God created Adam, he made a different kind of being. He did not say of the angels, which are so much better than us, let us make the angels in our image and likeness. He didn't say that of the angels. They're more beautiful than us. They're more powerful than us. They're more intelligent than us. In every little category, they are better than us. But they are not like unto God. When God created man, he said, Let us make man in our own image and unto our own likeness. We're such lower creatures than angels, and yet we are in the image and likeness of God. And what is it that we have that makes us especially like unto God? In his image and unto his likeness. It is our ability to increase and multiply. It is our ability to build and construct. It is our ability to take one thing that is in one way and make it into another. We can take that which is a tree and wood and we can make it into a house. We can make it into a statue. We can take it and turn it into something else. This is how God made us. And this is our nature. Now there are many perversions in the world today. But one of the perversions of our time is that we must simply maintain as we are. And you'll never see this anywhere in the lives of the saints. You'll never see this anywhere in the history of our church. It is not what God demands of us. We are demanded, we are created to know, love, and serve God. And by this means to save our souls. We're created to know, love, and serve God in order to give Him glory. And after we give him glory, then we will go to the kingdom of heaven. But we must go to the kingdom of heaven as human beings, as men, as the children of Adam, as the children of Eve. And these children are told three times by God, increase and multiply, increase and multiply, increase and multiply. So when we talk about the four characteristics of the church, the four signs that God is in something, the church says there are four marks, four signs. These are the minimum signs that God is present. If one of the signs is missing, God is not there. It means we are with the devil. These are the four minimum signs. The first one is one. The second is holy. The third is Catholic or universal. And the fourth is apostolic. And these four things go together. And remember, all four of them are the minimum signs. They are not the extraordinary signs, they're not the magnificent signs or the extra signs, the secondary signs. They are the minimum signs or the minimum marks that God is present. When we see the history of our church, including in the time of persecution, you will find these four marks are always present. In the first 300 years, there were many heresies. There are many attacks against the unity of the church. And yet the church did remain one. In maintaining the one faith, and those who kept that one faith, these continued to the next generation. The church remained holy. During this time, the sacraments of the church and the faith of the church turned wicked men into holy men, turned weak men into strong men, turned saints into greater saints. It made holiness. And the church was apostolic, Catholic, which meant that everywhere where the Catholic is, he turns everything into the presence of God. You go to church, and at the church, you attend the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And at the end of the Mass, the priest says, Ite Misa Est. Go, it is sent. 
What is sent? It is this holy mass. It is our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the holy faith that is sent out into the world. And we go back to our homes. What do we do? We put a crucifix in every room. We put, we put a place of prayer inside of the house, a little mini chapel inside the house. We will go to the workplace and we put crucifixes there. We go to the highways and we put crucifixes and we put holy pictures. Wherever the Catholic is, he must take his faith and his holiness that comes to the church and put it there. And the fourth characteristic is built on the first three. Are the first three characteristics really and truly there? Or are the first three characteristics a lie? When God came down to Adam, he created Adam perfect with those first three characteristics. And he went out and he saw the world. He named the animals and all the things he was supposed to do. He came back and said, it is, I, I want a creature like unto myself with which I can share what I know and what I love and what I have from God. It is not good for man to be alone. So apostolic is what, was what Adam was made. And then three times God gave the order, increase and multiply. And don't forget about Ascension Thursday. It's the same God who created Adam, who when he went up into heaven on Ascension Thursday, he turned to those 12 men and he said to them, Going therefore, teach ye all nations, preach the gospel to every individual creature, teach ye all nations whatsoever I have taught you, take what I have given you and carry it out. Now these 12 men were all put to death. St. John, of course, was uh, boiled in oil and he didn't die from the boiling in oil, but he still counted as a martyr and he ended up dying a natural death. But all 12 of them were, were, were to be put to death and 11 of them were actually put to death for carrying that faith. And they went to the ends of the earth. We must understand that this is an essential part and a minimal part of being Catholic. It's not an extra part. We also see in the time of persecution, in northern Africa, for instance, the majority of Africa was Catholic. Africa was Catholic. And Europe was pagan. In memory of those times, we still have this, this book, you notice, when the, when the missile is on the epistle side, it aims straight. That is, the altar is facing east, the missile streams eight, is straight. But when we're on the gospel side, notice we always turn the missile towards the north. This is because in the early centuries of the church, the first 300 years, the vast majority of Catholics lived in Africa. They were all in northern Africa. And Europe was pagan. And so they took the, the deacons took and turned and faced to the north. They faced to the north and they sang the gospel to the north to breathe the warmth of the gospel upon the cold north where the Romans were, where the persecution was. Africa was Catholic and Europe was not. But what happened? After 300 years, they were both Catholic. 300 years later, the Muslims came. And the Muslims came across Africa, and they wiped out the Catholic Church and the Catholic faith in Africa, and it never returned. There are still a few Catholics in Africa. And why is this? It was a punishment from God in his wrath. Because during those first 300 years, there were many martyrs in Rome. There were many martyrs in Constantinople, what is now called Constantinople. There are many martyrs in present-day Turkey. There are many martyrs in Bethlehem in Israel. There are many martyrs in France. There are many martyrs in, uh, as far north as Germany, all throughout the, the empire of Rome. And there were some martyrs in Africa. But the vast majority of Catholics in Africa Whenever a persecution came, the persecutions, they were far flung. Rome was on the other side of the water, the Mediterranean Sea. And there were some judges that were very cruel, and some judges were not very cruel. And some, a judge who was cruel would normally die after a short period. And they learned that persecution lasts for one year. And then there would be a two or three year gap. Then there would be a persecution for six months. Then there would be a couple year gap. Then there would be persecution for five years. And then, but, it, but in various strengths. And so they became very wise. The holy Catholics of Africa. And they did two things. When the persecution came, they went into hiding. And they acted as the, all the pagan Romans so that they would not be found out to be Catholic. When they were captured, 
And they were told, burn incense to the idol. They burn incense. Because they knew the teaching of our holy church. Which is, if you commit a sin, you can be forgiven. And so they burn incense. Knowing the persecution would be brief. That someone would kill the judge. And then the judge would be killed. And then they would go to confession. And they would be good Catholics again for a few years. Until the next persecution came. And the first ones to burn incense were the bishops. And after them, the priests. And after them, the faithful. And whole entire parishes gave up the faith just for a few years. Just for a few months. And then when the persecution was over, they all went to confession. And everything was fine. There was a reaction to this called the Donatist heresy. St. Cyprian himself was a Donatist in the, in the, thir in the 200s. And they were very angry that Catholics kept going back and forth. But St. Optatus, St. Augustine, and the fathers of the church taught, if a man sins, even if it's sin against the faith, if he repents, he is to be forgiven. But they did not really repent. They only apparently repented. And God is not mocked. When a bishop becomes a cardinal, and when a bishop becomes an auxiliary bishop, you know what is the custom of these bishops? No bishop can be a bishop without being the bishop of a diocese. That's no problem. There are hundreds of dioceses across northern Africa. They are now the Sahara Desert. They are now Muslim cities. They are now atheist cities. They are now have not a single Catholic or very few Catholics in them, and the dioceses are dead. So all that the bishop does is he says, you're the bishop of the diocese, of grain of sand 2.57 located in Algeria. Here are the diocese of a city that doesn't exist anymore located in e Ethiopia. Here are the diocese, and there's so many of them, we don't have to worry about it. But they were Catholic once upon a time. God did not forget that those holy Africans who gave to us this ceremony of turning the gospel to the north that it might become warm. What is now called the Sahara Desert was once like the Ukraine is today or the Midwest in the United States. Fields and fields and fields of wheat. It was the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. What is it now? It is a desert of death and growing death. Why? Because God was angry with the North Africans. He was angry with them who say they were holy Catholics, who were all Catholics, and what did they do in the time of persecution? They survived. They did two things. They hunkered down and played it safe. Then they burned incense. Hey, I do what I have to do. The descendants of these African Catholics are now called Indult Catholics. The descendants of these Catholics still exist in the world today. They are the conservative Catholics of our Holy Mother, the Church. They are not going to compromise the faith. But look, the Pope isn't going to be a bad Pope forever. There'll be a new Pope to take his place. Besides, Our Lady said there's going to be a good Pope one day. So we're just going to settle down and we're going to try to fit in in our diocese. We're going to be conservatives. God raised up Muhammad to deal with the conservatives. And God sent Tariq, the descendant of Muhammad, all throughout North Africa to the greatest persecution. And you know what they did in that persecution? They did the same thing they were accustomed to doing, what they had always done. The Muslims would attack a town in 635 AD in Northern Africa. And they would arrive at the town and say, you all have to become Muslims. And if you don't, we're going to kill you. And they did exactly what they were accustomed to do. It's just an idiot tribe from, 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 uh, from Arabia. They're just a bunch of nomads. They'll come through here. We'll become whatever religion they want us to be for a few years. They'll disappear and we'll go back to being good Catholics again. You wait. Because see, Bishop Filet, he's only going to be the superior of the society for a couple of years. And then they're going to put a good guy in. Paul VI, he's a bad pope. But they're going to put a good one in. After he dies, just lay low. Sign the papers. 
We don't believe all that garbage. Henry VIII was a nutcase. Henry VIII was crazy. He was bad. But come on, just keep a low profile. He's not going to be king forever. Remember, when he was a young man, he was called the defender of the faith. There's a saying in our holy world, the more things change, the more they remain the same. <clears throat> Turns out people haven't changed very much. Most of us Catholics throughout the world are just like the North Africans of the year 300 AD. And sure enough, in 630, the children of their fathers did what their fathers did. Here come the Muslims. And they said, you will become a Muslim, we're going to kill you. We don't want to die. We're becoming Muslim. So they did. And in a few years, we'll go back to being Catholic. 1,400 years have passed. They haven't gone back to being Catholic. God will forgive us. He always has. Bishop Sheen gives the example in the sacred scripture in the book of Judges how a man named Samson sinned with Delilah and then he was forgiven. And a man named Samson sinned with Delilah and he was forgiven. And he was forgiven. And he was forgiven. Until he finally told Delilah the secret of his strength which was the hair that God told him never to cut. And Delilah gave him a haircut. And he sinned with Delilah. And the book of Judges tells us, and Samson said, I will go out and shake myself as I did before. And he knew not that the Lord had left him. The Lord did not leave him all the other times he sinned. But this time the Lord left him, and he knew not the Lord had left him. He didn't know. This is going to happen to so many Catholics in our times. I'm just going to bow down a little bit. I'm just going to bide my time. Only I have to make a few compromises here and there. But I need my Holy Communion. I need my Mass. And don't worry, I've been forgiven so many times, I'm going to be forgiven again. The greatest breadbasket of Europe and Africa is now called the Sahara Desert. The great Catholics who gave us the custom of facing north when we sing the gospel, they are now all Muslims. They're not Catholics anymore. They have been worshiping Satan for the last 1,400 years, and they're very happy worshiping him. And you know what we say about the Muslims? Majority of them are Africans, North Africans, or Arabians. They were once the followers of Christ. It is noted concerning the Muslims that of all the false religions, Hindus convert, animists convert, Protestants convert, every false religion convert, atheists convert, but Muslims never convert. It's so rare for a Muslim to come back to God. You know one of the biggest problems in dealing with Muslims? They're just like their ancestors. The good ones are very nice. Oh, I love Jesus. I think he's a great prophet. I think he's the son of God. And Mary, we all love Mary, but she's not the mother of God. And Catholics are my best friends, but I believe in Allah. And they never convert. They are following the mediocre vomit of their ancestors who lived in order to be comfortable, who did not believe that there are four marks of being with God, one holy and Catholic, and the fourth one is to be apostolic. Then if you are a follower of Christ, in the time of persecution, you don't just hunker down and find a quiet place. You don't just burn incense and then say, I'll get, I'll get, they know it's that I don't really mean it. The persecution will come to an end. It says in the sacred scripture, God is not mocked. And I would that you are hot or cold. But if you are lukewarm, I will begin to vomit you out of my mouth. It says, begin, says St. Thomas Aquinas, because it never ends. The most disgusting time when we're vomiting is when we begin to vomit. That is when our stomach feels the most horrible and the vomit begins to come forth. And Christ says, I will begin to vomit, but I will never end in that vomiting. Christ will begin to vomit forever 
upon the mediocre, forever upon those who want to find a safe way through a crisis. What about in Europe? They were put to death, and they were put to death, and they were put to death, and what happened? Rome became Catholic. Germany became Catholic. The very violent Vikings who killed their own women and burned them in ships, who chopped off heads and sliced up babies, they became Catholic and stopped all those evil acts. What about the nice Africans? They were so nice. It was the safest place to be in the empire. The persecution was never as bad down there like it was in evil Rome. Try visiting Africa now. It's not so nice. They stopped being nice. Now throats get slit. Now things, people get killed. They're not nice anymore. Remember that sin is not only punished in hell. Sin is punished here on this earth. And then you get to go to hell. There are new North Africans everywhere in the Catholic Church today. They love the liturgy. You know, make sure we sing and face north during the gospel. When we have a solemn high mass in different places, where are you going to put the deacons? Stick them over here or stick them over there? You've got to find a spot so they can be facing liturgical north. So he does. Got the liturgy right. It's the warmth of the gospel that's supposed to convert the cold north. But there was no warm gospel there. Though there were some saints. There should have been so many more saints in Africa than there were in Europe. But there were very few. And the majority of them so easily turned against God. The entire diocese is so that now it's so easy. You make another auxiliary bishop. This diocese went defunct. That diocese went defunct. This diocese went defunct. That diocese, Bishop Emeritus of Diocese in the Desert. Good luck trying to find it. It will happen again. We must remember that our duty as Catholics is to have our holy faith and build. We must build the kingdom of Christ. And that's what we're doing at Our Lady of Mount Carmel. That's what Archbishop Lefebvre did. That's what made it different in the work of the Society of St. Pius X, which is now destroying the kingdom of Christ. Now trying to maintain its own comfort, and that's it. When Arvis Lefebvre built the Society of St. Pius X in 1969, 1970, it was in order to spread the kingdom of Christ, to build Catholic institutions, to convert souls to Christ, to bring vocations into the church, into seminaries, into the convents, monasteries, to bring souls to Christ and rebuild Christendom. And this is what we are supposed to do in the time of persecution. You look at all your guards when you're in prison. That guard might listen. I'll talk to him of Christ. There's a fellow prisoner. He doesn't know anything about Christ. Let me talk to him of Christ. And take my little bottle of, uh, of uh, what do you call it, San Pellegrino and baptize him. <laughs> Probably valid sparkling water. <laughs> Better take regular water next time. But you're going to baptize him. The fact is that we are here to spread our holy faith. In the time of persecution. And God allows there to be difficulties. He allows there to be struggles to see. Are you really human? Are you really a man? A man goes out and marries a girl. Doesn't wait till he's 60. And he has a bunch of babies. And he beats them and he raises them Catholic. A girl does not wait till she's 30 and had all kinds of fun. Has some kind of a crappy job. She gets married and she has babies. Start with twins and triplets because there aren't enough kids right now. So we got to have babies. And they take children and build the kingdom of Christ. And a man goes out and he works and he tries to convert the people in his workplace. And he speaks to them of Christ. It might not be in the most perfect manner. Like one of my prisoners when I was a young priest at the bingo, he grabbed a Protestant and he punched him and says, I pity you. <laughs> says you know you have to be good all the time or you're gonna go to hell but you know what I'm gonna beat you up right now and you know what I'm doing tomorrow I'm going to confession <laughs> and then I'm gonna be forgiven okay but you're up the creek pal and the guy converted better get beat up the fact is that even if you're mad spread the teeth 
We are members of a church which must be apostolic, a church that must grow and increase. It needs children, it needs converts, it needs vocations, it needs a building, and not just a surviving. Well, in any case, they'll close it at that. And after the Mass today, we'll show a little video of our seminary in Lake Mount Carmel in Kentucky. And uh, the, uh, we put together a couple of years ago. And uh, that, you know, continue the work of our sister Lefebvre. We must build the faith and spread the faith in a real and practical way. And so we establish missions, and we have a seminary, and we want to build schools, and we want to make Catholic families, get a young girl to meet a young guy who's actually Catholic, and a young girl who's actually Catholic, and they come together and have children, and raise them in our modern world, and some to go to be priests and brothers, others to go to be sisters and nuns, in order to spread our holy faith in this great time. This is the time to be a soldier of Christ. This is the time to be in his army. Our great saints were in those first 300 years when they were persecuted. And now is the time to be in the army of Christ as we're about to be in a deeper persecution. Let's grow in our faith and not follow the mistake of the North Africans of those first 300 years. We still turn the missile, but they no longer stand behind it. They're no longer there. We don't want to follow the ways of the mediocre, but the ways of the followers of Christ who have fire in their hearts and fire in their belly. Close to that, and God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.